Throughout my childhood, I lived in central Alabama. However, I have many stories along with my friends. This is just one of the stories I refused to talk about openly to my friends for many years, until I finally decided to share this spine-chilling story today on the show. The day was Saturday, November 8th, 1986. It was a cold evening in a small town called Stewart, Alabama, southwest of Talladega, Alabama. I was 15 and was walking down what at the time was a small dirt road called White Road with my golden retriever, Jack. The road was significantly more minor back then than it is today, so you would rarely see any cars. However, there is always this one old house, with one half of it made from wood and the other out of bricks. It's a very interesting looking house. It was about 30 or so feet away from the road. And it had a carport with what looked to be a black with a white stripe 1962 model Chevrolet Corvette. The house belonged to a lady who passed away in 1971. Now it belonged to her son, who lived up another mile up the road. I remember about a year or so before this occurred. I asked the man, who was in his 40s, why hasn't anyone gotten the Corvette? This man was excellent. He's given me old fishing lures and a tackle box before but what he told me still gives me chills to this day. He said, We would, but that Corvette is the same place mom and my aunt died of a heart attack. I remember making a response something along the lines of, I'm so sorry for your loss, or something along those lines. But then I dumbly asked him, So, you want the car to stay in their memory? He responded, No, it's because I do not dare get near that house. I asked him why and he never would tell me. And before I left, he said something like, stay away from that place. I don't want anyone else getting hurt. After that talk, I didn't even want to go around that house, as I had never really gone around that house but once or twice before. But one day, about a year after this, I decided to walk past it, and my curiosity got the best of me. Jack began to bark and growl, as I had never heard before. He had never done that time. He had also never done that in the times we had walked past it before, but it was different. The whole atmosphere was eerie. It was dark and cloudy that day and rather cold, and it didn't help that we were surrounded by deep thick woods for miles upon miles, so we were smack dab in the middle of the Alabama wilderness. You see, the area has definitely developed more since then, but is still relatively rural. As it was getting later by the minute, Jack began tugging on his leash so I slowly began walking over toward the house. Jack grew louder and louder the closer he got. Then, when we reached the Corvette, he stopped and started sniffing. I looked to my right to see a door that had fallen over, and I could see halfway into a very dark house with what looked to be a broken mirror at the end of it. Jack walked to the other side of the car and then turned his attention towards the door. It was almost as if everything froze. Jack didn't move for a solid 10 or 15 seconds, before he let out the most profound, loudest growl I had ever heard in my entire life. I've never heard a dog make this noise before. It was so guttural and primal. He never barked and he continued to growl and slowly began walking to the doorway. What seemed to be about five to 10 seconds between each step, he showed every single one of his teeth with his eyes squinted. He reached the doorway, paused from the growling and lunged forward with a leaping bark. I almost fell to the ground and barely hung onto his leash. He then barked repeatedly. I ran over to him, only to look up and see a figure in a white dress in that broken mirror, with distorted, wrinkly hands and very twisted long hair. I couldn't see it physically, but only in the mirror. I froze with shock and terror, blinking again and again, but the figure remained there. Blinking again and again, yet the figure remained there. I grabbed Jack's collar and ran off the porch with Jack behind me, back into the dirt road and into the wilderness. As everything got dark, I could barely see. After I got to the road, it sounded like two women were yelling, She needs help! I don't remember much after that. I just remember tripping and falling over a wooden bridge that crossed the small creek that I had to go over. I got back up, grabbed Jack's leash, and ran some more. I do not doubt that something would have happened if Jack and I had gone into that house. To this day, I dare not go down that road. Even though the man told me that he would finally demolish the house, 
I refuse to go anywhere near it. I don't want anyone to have a similar experience. Only you know the words cannot begin to describe the fear when you see or hear a strange figure. Like I said, this place has been developed a bit since then, but it is still very rural, and there is still a lot of wilderness around. But I don't know. There's something about that place that was just evil. Hello, my fellow horror enthusiast. Let's start my story. I am 15 years old, and this happened when I was 13. I live in Illinois, but this took place in Wisconsin. I will tell you the site's surroundings, because it will be important later in the story. We own about 200 acres of land in Wisconsin. My dad and I hunt on it a lot. Most of this land is covered in trees. There is a small garage and house where we store our weapons and sleep. There is a small gate where you enter the forest, and that's where our story starts. My dad and me, we will call him Andrew, we enter the gate, and we hike for a few miles. Also, just to let you know, our land is joined by a forest that is larger than 200 acres. We hiked a few miles to our hunting nest in one of the trees, and we waited for an hour or two, and didn't see a thing. No animals, or anything. Only birds singing and squirrels hanging out. After another hour of waiting, everything suddenly goes silent, and if you know when there is a large predator around, other animals generally become quiet and leave the area or hide. So we thought a bear was somewhere around us. Still, my dad told me bears don't live around here, so we questioned why it would be so silent. After about a half an hour of silence, I saw something I told my dad about, and he saw it too. I will give you the best description I can provide you. This thing, it was tall. It was about seven or eight feet tall if I had to guess, and its arms, oh my god, they almost reached the ground. It had these small yellow eyes and a vast, gaping mouth. We were scared absolutely crapless, looking at it until it snapped its head and looked at us, and growled. We thought it was going to attack us at any moment. Still, it just kept looking at us, like it was determining if we were alive, or if we were food, or maybe something like that. But after it darted by us really quickly, we had to turn around slowly. When we looked, it was still staring at us, but only for a few seconds, until it zipped into the forest, and we didn't see it until again later. So, I and my dad contemplated what the heck we were going to do. We had no idea what we had just witnessed, and what type of creature this was. We had no clue. So we waited for a few hours until it got dark, and that's when we thought it was a good idea to get the heck out of there. We left our hunting blind, and got back to our garage without incident and we went to sleep. Still, after a few hours, we were woken up to a scratching sound outside. My dad said it was like a raccoon or something, but I wasn't convinced. I took my dad's rifle and Glock just in case, and I looked outside, and there it was, the same creature from before. So what I did was slowly crept away to go upstairs to the first place where we slept. But when I was walking upstairs, I stepped on a creaky board, and this creature heard it. It screeched and slammed into the door. I thought it was going to break through, but somehow it didn't. It just cried a few more times and ran away. So we called the police and told them what we saw, but the police just shrugged it off as our imagination. But I swear to God, my dad and me saw it twice, and we even showed them the scratches. They just searched the perimeter, and that was pretty much it. They said that they couldn't really do anything because obviously there was no body or no proof that this creature was even here. I'm going to that place to hunt again soon, but we will be armed to the teeth. My dad got me a Glock as a present, and my dad got himself two Mossberg 590 shotguns for me and him to be safe. Let's hope we don't see this creature again. I'll tell you about the results later. This story is about my brother's experience at Pocahontas State Park in Chesterfield, Virginia. I'll be telling it from his point of view. During a sixth grade field trip to Pocahontas State Park, I was at the back of the line of my fellow classmates as we were making our way down the trail through the woods. I started feeling a bit nauseous and a teacher noticed I was trailing behind slower than the rest of the class and offered me a soda to try to calm my stomach down. She told me to sit on a log right off the trail 
sip on my soda, and rest for a bit, and she'd come back to check on me. She then jogged up to catch up with everyone else who had kept walking up the trail. I was sitting down at this point, alone in the forest. I heard a woman moan a few feet away from me. I looked up and couldn't believe what I was seeing. On a fallen tree just 10 feet away from me across the trail was a naked woman, lying on her side. Her skin was greenish gray, and she had minor cuts that weren't bleeding. They were all over her body from her neck to her chest. She had dark brown dripping hair. It was dripping wet as she had just gotten out of the water. She was not translucent. She was as solid as the tree she was laying on. I rubbed my eyes because I thought I was hallucinating from sickness and looked again, and she was still there, looking right back at me. I stared at her for about a minute or two. I heard my teacher walking around the trail, coming to come check on me. So I looked left to see where she was, and when I looked back towards the woman, she was gone. I started shaking uncontrollably. My teacher saw me and freaked out, thinking I was going to have a seizure or that I was cold due to being sick. Eventually, she walked me back to the bus to wait on the rest of the group. I didn't tell her what I actually saw right away, until about a week later. She searched online for any deaths that took place at the park, and lo and behold, she found an article about a woman in her 30s who was stabbed to death in the shower in 1986 by her boyfriend in one of those cabins, just about 50 yards from where I saw the naked green figure. I've experienced paranormal activity a lot, but that's the only time I've ever seen an apparition, and it scared me to death. My brother has told me many other stories, and every time I hear this particular one, it makes me freak out. If it were I that saw a naked, wet, stabbed green lady in the woods, I would have probably peed my pants right then and there. Hello, I'm going by Frederick. It's not my real name because I'd like to remain anonymous. I'm a male, and my age is not going to be disclosed to a bunch of strangers. I'm not entirely sure if I'm doing this submission thing right, but this happened to me a few days ago while on vacation to Texas. I'm not a great writer, so Swamp Dweller, please bear with me. So, for a while now, I've been interested in the paranormal, and stories about skimwalkers, wendigos, and flesh gates are my most favorite. So, for context, I went down to Texas from Minnesota for my older sister's wedding. The night after the wedding, I was at my cousin's with two of my older sisters and my little cousin, who we will call Maya. So, Maya wanted to play a game called Ghost in the Graveyard, which is essentially a hide-and-seek tag type game, very similar to Manhunt. A group of people counts while one hides. When you find the hider, aka the ghost, you yell, Ghost in the Graveyard. And the ghost runs and tries to tag as many people as possible. I was the ghost, and the house was in the extensive driveway. To its left is a slight overhang and a giant grassy field, and to the right is my grandfather's workshop, and behind that was a very vast state forest. Their house is near the end of the garage and next to the forest. I was hiding in the side of the house, crouched down in a black hoodie and sweatpants, feeling all sneaky. After about three or so minutes of hiding, I heard plants being walked through coming from the forest to my right. I looked over, expecting a squirrel or something, one of my siblings or maybe another family member. But there was something that I didn't expect. Now I saw a white-tailed deer staring straight at me. Its neck was long like an elk, its mouth was hanging open. Its teeth were sharp, yellow, and brown with reddish stains. It looked like they were rotting. It just stared at me, unblinking, and I stared back in fear. It was honestly a horrific sight, and I was about to pee myself as all the stories of not deer and skimwalkers rushed to my head. I got up and ran into the driveway, and my cousin saw and yelled ghost in the graveyard and jumped onto the trampoline, which was the safe zone. But I did not care. I was crapping myself in the middle of the driveway, trying to escape this deer. I just said I was tired and went inside and laid on the couch, and we spent the rest of the night in there. The following day I went outside and in the driveway there were so many dead rabbits out of nowhere. Their stomachs had been like ripped open almost surgically, and their organs were gone. The brains and everything else were still there. I about threw up and I saw nothing more for the next three or so days that I was there. 
Thank you for sharing my story. It was a great stress relief writing this. I know it was short and to the point, but this is what I saw. If anybody has any idea if I saw a not deer or something else, please comment down below. I would love to know anybody's suggestions. Hey Swamp Dweller, I work at a state prison on the edge of a national forest in North Carolina. This place is home to murderers and other criminals, the worst of society. Anyway, the forest always gives off a creepy vibe, especially at night, the shift I currently work. I am a 50-year-old male who is comfortable in the woods and doesn't scare easily, but this forest does not feel right. I always feel like something is watching. I was doing a routine patrol around the outside fence this night. The fog was weighty, so you could only see about five feet in any direction. The usual forest sounds were making their concert like any other night. At the far point of the entrance, all went silent, which was noticed immediately. You could hear footsteps in the forest just inside the tree line, two-legged bipedal steps. Having grown up in the woods and being a retired army ranger, I am confident I can handle most situations. I caught a glimpse of something moving to my right, where the forest began. There were two amber eyes about eight feet off the ground, and it let out a deep, guttural growl from the darkness. I was armed with a 12-gauge shotgun and a 9mm sidearm. Out of habit, I rack around into the chamber of the 12-gauge. The forest is full of deer, coyotes, wolves, and once in a blue moon, black bear. Not giving it too much more thought, I continued my patrol. Now, I should mention that the prison has guard towers about 300 yards apart, and there are eight around the area, with a gravel path leading to each of them. This eight-foot thing steps out from the darkness behind me. I heard the heavy foot hit the gravel, and within seconds, it was on full-on run mode towards me. I ran for the closest guard tower, which was only about 20 feet away, stuck my keys in the lock, and snatched the door open. I dove inside just as the metal door slammed shut and this thing hits the door with all of its force, which shook the concrete of the steel tower. You could hear it snarling and hitting the door. I climbed to the top to get a look at what the hell just happened. I just caught a glimpse of it sinking back into the forest darkness. It was an eight foot tall, hairy covered man, like some sort of creature with a wolf tail. I'm not sure what just happened. I called the commander on duty and asked him to drive around the tower. I wanted him to come pick me up because I was way too scared and I had turned my ankle and didn't want to walk back to the entrance. When he arrived, I heard him say in a loud voice, what in all that is holy? On the outer side of the metal door was a massive dent and a claw mark that had four distinct marks. Without a word, we got back in the truck and drove back to the prison entrance. From that point, foot patrol was turned into a driving truck patrol. So this encounter happened many years ago, and I was very young at the time. It was in 2001 or 2002 when I was 11 or 12. My uncle was interested in purchasing some land near Red Oak, Oklahoma. I do not know precisely where, but several acres were in a very remote area. My father, mother, and I decided to accompany him one Saturday to scope out the property. From our home, it was a little more than a three-hour drive, but we all love riding in the car. So while it would not be the most eventful road trip, we went to get out of the house. Upon arrival, I remember being very underwhelmed by the place. There were no houses anywhere near, and hardly any signs of any life apart from a few birds, and the wooded area wasn't exactly what I would call picturesque. Still, we parked our car off the road to explore the woods a bit. My uncle was talking about buying the land for hunting, which is not my cup of tea. As we walked through the woods, it was a lovely day, but still something felt off. Everyone in our group remarked about the eerie feeling, but my dad and uncle laughed it off. My mom had goosebumps and kept looking over her shoulder, which made me on edge too. She was insistent that it was weird and wanted to leave, saying it felt like she was being watched. After a bit of hiking, I noticed a small red building. I've seen bigger storage sheds in the suburbs, but it looked well built. My uncle said there was something weird about it, 
and there was nothing about it on the listing, so we went to peek inside. The door was open, and inside were open cans of food, a ratty blanket on the floor, and it stunk, unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. Following this discovery, we all agreed it would be best to return to the car. If there was some crazy hermit living in the woods, we didn't want to be around to find him. The only issue was we had walked far into the woods and now weren't exactly sure which direction was correct. The eerie feeling excited, and we were all on edge. We ended up trekking another mile before we finally found the road. We were further down from where we had parked, but at least we could follow the road now. Walking along the road, we came across a genuinely unsettling sight. Right in the middle of the asphalt was a dark gray cat on fire. I have no idea why a cat was out in the middle of nowhere or how it came to be killed and set ablaze. This had just happened, but there was no one in sight. Naturally, we ran the rest of the way to the car. There was a massive scratch in the paint down the side of it. Somebody had keyed it. Thankfully, that was the only damage. My dad was able to start it without any trouble, and we drove away as fast as we possibly could. My heart is sped up just recounting this moment, one of the scariest moments of my life. My uncle did not buy the land, and I'll never forget this terrifying encounter. Still, like anything, over time I pushed it to the back of my mind, and it just became one of those odd moments you occasionally recall and tell at a family get-together years later. It's almost like a funny story. I'm sharing this because I was reminded of it last night while binge-watching some episodes of an unsolved YouTube channel show where they shared the story of a family that disappeared in the same area while also looking for some land for sale. The Disappearance of the Jameson Family is the name of the mystery in the video if you're interested. The family died in the same area we were searching, roughly seven years after we made our trip there. There are many theories about their deaths, including allegations of some sort of cult in the area, complete with something about dead cats. Coincidence? Probably but the whole story gave me chills. So if my family narrowly avoided being killed by some witches, a cult, or something else, or if we just stumbled upon a hermit who didn't want us in his woods. Hi, Swamp Dweller. I believe in all things supernatural and always listen to your YouTube channel. Although my stories do not contain any sightings of cryptids or strange creatures, it was bizarre. I live in South Carolina, and on a hot summer day, my best friend and younger brother decided to go to Pisgah National Forest in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina for a day of exploring. We were all teens with no criminal history or drinking or drug use. We were mostly planning on just driving gravel roads that veered off into the woods from Highway 176 that leads from the town of Brevard to the Blue Ridge Parkway. We had a fantastic day. We had a long hike, and we were in a great mood. Towards the evening, we found another gravel road named South Mills River Road, and we drove down it hoping to find a river at the end. The road soon led to a closed gate in a small clearing where a car was parked in the woods. It seemed like it had been parked there for quite a while. According to satellite imagery, the river was about a mile beyond the closed gate. So we parked the car, got all of our gear out, and started walking. Overall, the woods were very silent and somehow very unwelcoming. This was public hunting land. So, plenty of beer cans indicated the type of people that used this area. As far as I know, there were no open hunting seasons at the time, and we felt good about it and continued walking, trying to keep up the happy mood despite the gloomy and creepy atmosphere. We followed the road until it led to the South Fork Mills River, where the road ended. We came to a decent clearing called Wolf's Ford Roadside Camping, where a lone tent was up. On the edge of the clearing towards the river, there was a stone tower about six feet by six feet and about 15 feet tall with a metal staircase leading to a heavy metal door at the top of the building. The door was shut and covered in bullet marks where people had clearly shot at it. A heavy metal trap door was also welded at the tower's base. About 30 yards away, a geological marker was cemented into the ground. Although, to you, this might sound like a typical scene, for us it was downright creepy. The absence of people, the doors being welded shut, the lone tent, it all had a very dark vibe. 
What was that door hiding? Why was this tower built out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains? We fished for probably two hours and then all decided that we needed to leave as the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. I don't know if this was just some abandoned research station or an abandoned mill operation, but this was so far from civilization that I highly doubt it. The biggest thing was the overwhelming feeling of something not being right. I've heard stories on this channel of the oddly placed building leading to underground tunnels where some sort of experiments were definitely happening, so who knows. One thing is for sure, I'll be going back there for more information. I did all the research I could but could not come up with any information on any buildings or projects in that area. So, if anyone has any idea what's going on at South Mills River Road, at the South Forks Mills River near Wolf's Ford Roadside Camping Spot, please let me know. And Swamp Dweller, if you decide to share my story, I greatly appreciate it. Hello Swamp Dweller. For privacy reasons, I will go by L. For some context, I'm 10 years old and I live in Sydney, Australia. While the city is lively and reasonably safe, the bush is a different story. Apart from the fact that every animal here seems to want to kill you, the bush hides more sinister secrets. I remember that in one of his reports, Sam White Owl mentioned the crawlers. These humanoid creatures definitely live in Australia as well. Every year, people report seeing crawlers across Australia. But now, let's get to my actual story. A few months ago, my father and I decided to look for frogs at Flat Rock Gully. We had been to the gully before at day, but never in the nighttime. I was excited about it as it was my first ever frogging trip. We packed all the gear in the car and arrived. We only heard crickets at first, but then we heard something else. It sounded like a soft howl. My dad and I walked along with the sounds continuously coming and going. We went through a tunnel and made a joke about some creature living in there. We arrived at a large open area. It was a perfect habitat for the eastern dwarf tree frog. Then I saw something. It had a round owl-like face, large eyes, no mouth, and a long, lean body. It was on all fours, even so, I knew it was small. No taller than one meter or three feet tall. It looked almost young, appearing as if it was not yet fully grown. The creature just watched us from afar. I reckon my father never saw it. I refused to tell him out of fear of him not believing me. The creature then hid behind a bush entirely out of my view. We continued on our way, both feeling uneasy and the house carried on. We got to the end of the trail and went home. I told my father, and he said he didn't see anything, but heard the noises and felt uneasy as if we were being watched and followed. He said he believed me, but I don't know if he actually does or not. You might be thinking it was a wallaby or another native animal, but wallabies are extremely rare in bushland near the suburbs, and no other native animal moves like that. I don't know what it was, and I'm hoping a viewer can tell me. I'm sorry if this story was not as action-packed as others. I will try to revisit Flat Rock Gully when I get the courage, but my advice is, do not visit Flat Rock Gully at night, and no matter where you are, if you hear the soft howls, get out, and remember, always check the bushes, you'll thank me. Hello Swamp Dweller, my name is Jonathan. This story I'm about to tell you takes place on the reservation. I will not disclose the exact location if any other encounters occur and someone would die instead of me living to tell the truth. It began when I got up at 6am to do basic tasks and chores. I set out for myself before heading to work like I always did. I will not give the tedious details of my day, but it was expected and I would come back home sometime around 7.45pm. I get out of the truck, and not too much sooner, I get this feeling that I'm being watched. Now part of my land is on the reservation. It has these deep, thick woods on it. I often will jog through them to keep myself in shape. It's always great to stay in touch with nature as well. I looked around, but saw nothing. I went up the stairs to greet my tubby cat and my dog Quicksilver. He is a Doberman mixed with Great Dane but his coat had patches of white that were curling and lining that made me think of X-Men. 
so that's why I gave him the name. He wasn't scared of much. He was always protective of me and always knew if something didn't have good intent. But for now, I will continue with what happened after I greeted my pets. So after I fed them, I took Quicksilver for a walk. As we got out, he dead stopped walking, sniffed the air, and growled. It was unlike him because he had never done this before. As much as I didn't like it, and Silver didn't like it, you gotta go. But before that, I stopped by my truck, opened the door, and got my custom Remington 1100 made for unique slugs. But I just loaded my regular buckshot because I didn't know what to expect. I and Silver headed away from the truck to start the walk. I look at the sky, seeing the sun setting. It is getting dark, and I just keep going. And thankfully, Silver did his business, and I let him back into the house. I got back out, still holding my 1100, grabbed my shovel, and walked up to pick up Silver's, you know, mess. As I shovel it up and throw it away, Quicksilver howled so loud and barked in harsh tones. I looked behind me, and of course, I saw this thing bolting at me with incredible speed. Since it was dark, all I saw were pure yellow eyes shining as they went up and down. I took one look in my sights and fired, and it didn't seem to do anything but piss it off. I bolt to the door and slam it shut. I lock all three locks and back up. Silver runs up in front of me, growling and then barking viciously. Suddenly, I hear three loud bangs up on my door. I go up to my room and Silver runs with me. I load a shell and hold one more in my pocket. After cocking the 1100, something busted right through my front door as it let out this gut-wrenching roar that shook the foundation of my home. It damaged everything in anger looking for me. It started banging, and then suddenly it stopped. I heard nothing, and then a massive bang and the whole door I was behind smashed into pieces. Now I was face to face with what my people would call Yi Nan Lushi, or a skinwalker. It smelled of rotten meat, death, and decay. Its face was that of a skull with other animals melded to the top of it. Nothing good comes from this creature. I pointed the barrel towards it, this unholy thing, and pulled the trigger. At first, they went through, but the skinwalker looked unfazed. It just stood there and looked at me, with this look as if it was just annoyed. I load my last shot and pull again. Then, just like that, the skinwalker lit a blaze, screaming in pain. It charges at me as I dodge out of the way onto my bed, and it jumps clear out of the window running toward the woods, but not before letting out another screech. This time, it was so loud it reached me and hurt my eardrums. As it resided back to the woods, it was running so fast you could still see a blink of light running through the forest before disappearing. Quicksilver was smart and hid under the bed. I got him out and calmed him down as he was shaking and terrified. I don't blame him for his behavior. I've seen a medicine man since then, and have had my pets and my home blessed. After that, nothing seemingly interesting has happened, and I've gone on with my life. Thank you, Swamp Dweller, for sharing my story. Howdy, Swamp Dweller. My name is Colton. I've just turned 19, I'm 6 foot tall, and a male. I've grown up around farms and hunting my entire life. I've encountered a handful of scary things, and some things that are just entirely unexplainable, so I thought I might share a handful of them here with you. I've had run-ins with spirits, demons, and even some creatures. I guess I've just gotten lucky. Anyway, I will talk much more about a more believable story today because it has to do with a much more understood animal. Boar hogs. Now, I've always been a little scared of them. They are little savages. Sometimes not so little. Just something about a pig scream gets to me. Not to mention that wild hogs can have a long tusk. So, they are formidable. Seeing the best way to deal with them one-on-one -on -one, is to either have a good gun or climb a tree and pray they leave. Anyway, I'll get on with my story. I'm from a little town in central Texas. I won't say the exact town, but it's between Austin, Texas and Temple, Texas. Over the past few years, hogs have been a nasty problem. They tear up the land and are downright dangerous. This story takes place in 2020 after COVID had begun. The whole incident happened very fast. 
It was trash day, and my driveway is more of a dirt road that stretches about a tenth of a mile than an actual driveway. Also, my house is out in the country, rather in the middle of nowhere, and homes are very few and far between. If you were looking at my house from the driveway, on the same side of the road on both sides of my house, with about a quarter mile in between, was my grandparents' house and neighbor's house. Other than those two, it was nothing for at least a couple of miles, depending on where you were headed. It was time to go, so I had to drag the trash can to the end and walk back. It's not a huge chore, but I had to do it. I didn't mind, though, because it let me enjoy a little time with myself and my dog, Maymay. Maymay is a sweet little blue lacy with enchanting eyes, and she's super intelligent and protective of my family and myself, and even protects our other dogs if she feels the need. If she was alpha female, then I was alpha male to the dogs, and they showed us both respect, and we showed each other respect. She would often walk with me when I took out the trash which made this day odd. This day, I had forgotten to take the garbage out until it had gotten late, so it was already dark. I started walking when I realized Mei, Mei wasn't with me. She was still watching me on the porch. I called her, but she just wagged her tail and whined as if to say, bad idea, don't leave, stay with me, come here, or come see me. I usually would go back and check on her, but I figured I would just be going to the end of the driveway and back, and I'd be okay. This did put a little worry in me though. I'm not easily scared. I was spooked by Mei Mei, my seemingly fearless pup who's outsmarted and tangoed with strays and wild dogs and hogs, not wanting to budge. Halfway down the driveway, I smelled an awful stench that I could only describe as roadkill amplified by two. At this point, I realized Mei Mei stayed back because she didn't think it was safe for her or me. I stopped dead in my tracks and listened. But it was windy that night, so I could hardly hear anything. I decided after standing and trying to listen for a bit longer to brave the walk and finish my task. Then I'd hightail it back home as fast as I could. Keep in mind that I'm pulling a decent-sized trash can, and it's not exactly quiet, so my position is undeniable, even with the wind. I expected something to happen, honestly. I had adrenaline running the entire time I walked. I made it to the end of the driveway, parked the trash can where it could be retrieved, and turned around to return the way I came. Now I'm walking back home and I can see the porch lights brightening my front yard, so I can easily see where to go. I took a deep breath and sighed with relief. Okay, just gotta walk home. I'm practically home free. I was cut off mid-thought when suddenly, I felt even more uneasy than before, and I began to shake with adrenaline. The smell was more vital than ever and I would have puked if my stomach had been weak. I heard a low, strained grunt followed by another and another. There was no mistaking that sound. They were pigs. As soon as I heard this, a switch flipped in my head. Run, freaking run, I thought. I knew these pigs could run and outrun me if they really wanted to, but if I hurried, I felt that I could at least get to my dad's truck in the driveway and jump in to avoid them. If they were close enough, I wouldn't make it. I bolted. I'm not a typical fast guy, and I tried to take it slow and easy, but my legs sprouted wings because I was flying back home, scared out of my mind, and I could hear the grunting getting louder and louder. Suddenly, I heard a sound that made my heart sink. When hogs sprint, they make a sound that sounds like a mix of grunting, coughing, and growling. I knew it meant that they knew where I was, and they were headed right for me. They could probably see me, and they were coming to get my ass. I began running faster, as fast as my legs would carry me. I started thinking, trying to figure out what to do, and then it hit me. Mei Mei, help! God, I love that dog. As soon as she heard me, she barked loudly and started running for me. She was coming to get me, or at least help make a distraction. She was fast, and I knew she could efficiently run those pigs if needed, so I didn't worry about her getting away. She came and started yipping at me as if to say, hurry the hell up. I was now going as fast as I have ever gone in my life with Mei Mei at my side. I made it, got to the porch, and spun around. I knew if those hogs were there, I wanted to see them because I wasn't going to leave Mei Mei alone with them now. And then I realized the screams were gone. I didn't see or hear the pigs anymore, but I could still smell them. I went inside and grabbed the first gun I could reach, which was a 12-gauge shotgun and a box of shells for it. 
I ran outside and sat with my good girl for a few minutes. The smell eventually went away and they left. I believe the scent of a canine combined with me coming into the light of my house was enough to make them decide against chasing me any further. Because I don't think I would have made it home otherwise, but it was definitely scary. I petted up that dog and I still love her today. She's older now and has retired from being an adventure dog, but she's still my doggo and I still take great care of her. About a week later, my dad and I went driving, and we slowed down and said, Hey, look, hogs. I looked up to see a group of hogs, at least 30 of them, anywhere between 200 and 500 pounds. They were huge. There is no doubt in my mind that this was the group that I had run into. This was about one mile from my house. I still see signs that they are around us, but I don't go out at night anymore. I take care of everything I need in the daylight. One night, when I lived in a car with my husband and two dogs, some strange things happened to my husband and me. It had been at least eight days since I had slept very well, so I was damn tired and cranky. As I lay down in the makeshift bed in the back of the car that night, I immediately started falling asleep. Since it was almost midnight, it was quiet at the Vista Point by then. Just as I was barely starting to dream, an urgent shaking on my shoulder woke me up. Loudly, I startled awake and demanded, What? However, I opened my eyes and quickly realized that our car was illuminated by a very bright light. Since it was a very famous spot, Vista Point, seeing other vehicles and people pulled over beside you wasn't unusual. Plus it was dark, so the light was necessary. By then I heard this strange male voice yelling, Sorry, I thought y'all maybe needed some light since your car was so dark over there, is all. My husband immediately responded, No thanks man, we're going to sleep, that's why we have it so dark over here. For a few seconds I heard only silence until the stranger answered, Well, what if I needed more light or something? An odd thing of him to ask, seeing as how he was the only one with the bright light, which was pointing at our car and not his. So I spoke up, finally replying with, we don't have any good lights. The stranger replied, Oh. So once again, I rolled my eyes hard that time, putting my headphones back into my ear, and I moved around again to try to sleep. I noticed the bright light the guy had on our car quickly turned off, and then I heard his vehicle start up and pull out of there. So naturally, I started to drift off to dreamland once again. To my dismay, not even 20 minutes later, I got another, more frantic feeling of shaking on my shoulder. That time though, I was pretty pissed off, so I sat up, glared at my husband and angrily hissed out, what? Through clenched teeth. They're back, and they're walking around out there, he said with panic creeping into his tone. So I again pulled the headphones out of my ears and listened for a second. I heard footfalls on the blacktop as I kept listening though I noticed the footsteps sounded like they were headed to one of the two RVs, also parked there for the night. The two RV vehicles were parked directly across the circle of Vista Point from us. Seriously pissed off at that point, I hissed at my husband. I'm pretty sure that's just someone going back to one of the RVs. I guess now would be the time to alliterate the layout of said Vista Point. It's a large cul-de-sac that overlooks a sizable, artificial reservoir. It's the sixth largest in my state. It also happens to be the location of where the Carrie Stainer murders, aka the Yosemite serial killer, roamed. Anyways, people often trek across the large cul-de-sac to use the bathroom. On the freaking reel though, yet again not even ten minutes later, another freaking shaking on my shoulder. I just sat up and yelled loudly, what the hell now? My husband began to whisper to me in a panic. Another car just pulled up and when it did, two guys came out of the RVs and met up with the dude in the car. I tried to cut in angrily, but my husband interrupted with, they were talking, and all three looked over towards our car. Then they started walking towards us with their flashlights on, but they turned them off when they noticed that I was awake when they were halfway to our car. Since I still had one of my headphones in, I didn't quite catch all of what he said at the time. So now I should also tell you that I'm the kind of person who, when woken up, gets really pissed. So... I lost my cool on my poor husband, and I started yelling at him. My husband responded by hissing at me to either get up front so we could start loading up the car, 
or stay where I was in the back, and he would pretty much pile things on top of me. I yelled some more, but I did eventually get up front. Thankfully, we got out of there safely. On our way out, my husband told me that the first dude with the bright light on their car had a huge hunting knife strapped to his waist. My husband also said to me when I started yelling after being startled awake several times, all three guys turned around and slowly dispersed. We'll never know if the incidents were related, but that's one hell of a coincidence that those three guys were coming at our car less than 20 minutes later, don't you think? An Inhuman Monster in the Road by Skyler Hello, my name is Skyler. For safety reasons, I will not be using the actual names of the people involved in this event. I will refer to them as Alan, Dave, and Willie. For some background information, Alan, Dave, and I have known each other our whole lives. Living in a small town and our parents all being close friends, it was inevitable. Willie moved to our town six months before this incident. We live in a small, small town outside of Pittsworth in Queensland, Australia. So now we're staying at Alan's house because her parents would be out of town for two nights. Around 11 p.m., Alan and I showed the boys your channel because they didn't know what cryptids were. At 1 a.m., we all got bored and decided to go for a long drive because I had just gotten my license. While grabbing blankets, snacks, and drinks, we all talked about where to go, and Willie suggested we drive down to Gundawindi because he had never gone there, and we all stupidly agreed, even though we grew up hearing stories about that highway. At 1.30, we were ready to go and were all leaving. It was about 40 minutes to the next town between Pittsworth and Gundawindi. The only village between the two was, was Milmoran. The drive to Milmoran was peaceful and not eventful, besides seeing the occasional kangaroo or fox cross the road. There wasn't anything exciting about this drive, it was just farmed on either side of the road. We had the windows down, enjoying the warm summer night and the music up loud. As we got into the town, we turned down the street, and Dave started telling Willie the spine-chilling stories we heard growing up on the highway from Milmoran to Gundawindi. Once we got on the road again, Willie began to get creeped out. So we practically begged Dave to stop telling him the stories, and with a laugh from Alan and I, he stopped, and Alan turned the music back up. Around 10 minutes onto the highway, we started getting into the more dense area of the forest surrounding the road, and there was no light pollution anymore. Hence, the only light was my car headlight, which lit up probably 10 feet to the sides of us and about 100 feet in front of us. Alan pointed at a group of four kangaroos we had assumed were roadkill, which wasn't unusual around our area, but after a few minutes, a putrid smell hit us. We rolled the windows up and turned down the music to talk about it. Then Willie rolled his window down and vomited outside. Honestly, we weren't even surprised because he did have a weak stomach from not being used to the horrible smells from living in the city all his life up until about six months ago. He rolled his window back up after tipping the water out the door to ensure the vomit was gone. Dave mentioned how putrid the smell was and described it as roadkill mixed with the tip of a hot summer day, which Alan and I agreed with him. Then a massive roo bounded out in the road like it was trying to escape from something, which we found kind of odd. That's when Dave roared, What the hell is that? About 20 meters in front of our car in our lane stood about a 6 to 7 foot inhuman creature with glowing red eyes and arms that nearly touched the road. I swerved around it just in time and sped up, and Alan looked in the side view mirror and screamed, It's running after us! I swung my head around and saw it. It was tailgating the car even though I was going like 86 miles per hour trying to escape it. The car started fishtailing, and I could hear loud thumps on the back of the car. It was straight up a flat road, so I sped up to probably about 100-110 miles per hour, which was just enough to get away from it but we couldn't get away from it without being terrorized and absolutely traumatized. I have no idea how to explain it. Eventually, it took us about 40 miles to get into town. Only then did we feel a little bit more comfortable when we saw some car parks. We sat in the car until about 8.30 a.m., and that's when we decided it was probably safe to drive back home. It was honestly the most terrifying experience of my life, 
and I don't think we'll ever drive on this highway by ourselves or at night ever again. The Cage in the Wood by Yes, I'm Fluffy 99. At the time, I was a 20-year-old female who had just moved to a small upstate town. I had grown up in a slightly larger town about 60 miles away and just wanted a new start. I love camping and often go camping in the Adirondacks, but at the time, I hadn't yet made friends to go camping with, so I wasn't going to go into the real woods alone, if you know what I mean. Down the road from me, I had been walking around and found an area where the power lines cut through a wooded section. The power lines were perpendicular to the road. It was near a house, but far enough to the right to the place where I don't think anybody would see me if they were walking the trail that the power lines made. I'm not sure about other countries, but in the United States, they keep power lines clear in case of maintenance. So I wander up there, noticing how it's pretty deep woods, and how far I can get away from the house that I saw on the road, they couldn't possibly think I'm trying to break in. And then, bing, I get an idea. I could go camping up here. It's secluded enough to give the natural woods experience, but close enough to the road that I wouldn't be in danger of wildlife or anything like that. So, I do. I set up camp in this little clearing that I accessed by climbing the hill, following the power lines, then turned left onto what seemed to be some sort of deer trail. Deer are absolutely everywhere in New York. Then I came upon this lovely flat grassy clearing. After clearing the dead wood away, I built my fire off to the side. I'm feeling brilliant and independent. It was creepy to sleep in the woods alone, sure, as I had always had at least one camping companion. But hey, whatever. New experiences build new skills, you know? I wandered further down the path the next day to see where it led. I walk for about an hour, and I can see some fields on the right. But they are in the distance, and there is a fence between the fields and the path. So again... I figure people can't be mad for me being here. Then I come across another path. Heading to the right, I follow it. A couple of feet in, it curves slightly and there's an old van to the left of the path. Well, that's strange. But it's about 1pm near noon anyway, in broad daylight and the birds are chirping. So I don't really feel in danger. I go up to the van which had been there for a very long time, clearly. It was like a 70s style make, it made me kind of think of Scooby-Doo. And there were overgrown weeds all around it. There are streaks of brownish red going down the side from the bottom of the doors. I looked in and saw what appeared to be an old bedding or something in the back, but it was all shredded up and the curtains in the windows were shredded as well. There was clothing strewn about. It looked like the clothing was from the 70s or early 80s. I still felt no danger per se. Snickering at the terrible fashions back in the day, I continued along the path for a short time until I finished rounding another slight bend. I stopped dead in my tracks, finally. My reptile sense went off, or whatever you call it. I wake the hell up, and it, it, I'm just, my head is screaming at a total volume that I've never heard before. Up ahead, there is this creepy-ass doll hanging from the tree, by its neck, with a noose. Not just stuck in the trees, but just left there as it was hanging. It was terrifying, to say the least. To the right of it, though, there was this huge cage-like structure, easily big enough to hold a full-sized human. It seems to be made up of pipes and other long metal objects, just welded together. Some were up, some were down, some were across, and the squares they made weren't big enough to fit my head through, let alone anything else. Not that I tried, anyway. It had four sides and a ceiling. It had other creepy-ass dolls hanging from it. It also had reddish-brown stains running down the sides, just like the van. Further behind it in the distance was a run-down house. Creeped out as hell, I just turned tail and ran. I am not a runner by any means. I am a chunky girl, and I have smoked for more than six years, and I do not run. But I ran that day. I don't even remember the run, and I remember coming up upon my campsite, grabbing my tent in one swoop as I ran past. Luckily, I had put all my things into the tent. Ripping it out of the ground as I continued running, I left my cooler, my food, and all that stuff behind. I never went back for it either, and sometimes I kind of feel bad about that though. I dropped the tent stakes along the way and had to repair rips in my tent. I tore down that hill. I'm still surprised it didn't break my neck or ankle. Jumped in my car and sped home. I locked all my doors, then paced my house going, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell, for hours. It's been 11 years since that incident, and even typing it now makes my hands shake. I currently live almost 1400 miles away, but I still made sure my doors were locked 
And they are. The crazy thing is, is I wasn't even that deep in the woods. Maybe in the 1970s it would have been, who knows. As it stands now though, people live within a short walk of this place. And no, I know you will ask, I did not call the cops. I can't articulate why. My best analysis looking back is that I didn't want the creep to find me. I should have probably called them at the very least. You are probably right there. I hope it was an old crime scene and not some sick man who still keeps people in cages in the woods. Don't Follow the Faces in the Mist by S.F. Sundown Don't follow the faces in the mist. It was a throwaway line, but one I should have listened to. We had finished up a block of training and our instructor, a wiry man everyone called Buck, invited us out for drinks. Most of the group joined, but a few stayed along. A lot of them were locals and had places to be. I was happy to have the company. As the night wore on, Buck's stern exterior came down. It is common enough to almost be a rule that sternness comes from a place of care and concern. Though sometimes misplaced, it was not so with Buck. His job was to prepare us for what we would face in our field and provide us with the tools to execute it as rangers, and he took it seriously. I was happy to have him as a teacher. At the end of the night, we said our goodbyes. He slapped down a hand on my shoulder and took in a breath. He lifted his head with his drooping eyelids and looked at me with a sustained intensity that shook clear the clouds of drunken mind. He said, The Smoky Mountains are a remarkable place, but promise me one thing, don't follow the voices in the mist. It took me five years before I discovered why. The call came through in the early afternoon. A kid had wandered off from the campsite a few miles down the road from the ranger station. The situation is common enough. Someone had wandered off and couldn't find their way back or had managed to get themselves stuck. The majority of these calls resolve themselves the same day. We find the person and issue stern warnings. Hell, sometimes it is all over by the time we even get there. But not always. And no one in our station needed any reminding. Posted on the notice board beside the front door is a picture of Jessica. Her photo has been there for the entire five years I have worked at the station. She went missing the summer before I started. She is still there because we never found her. Jessica's father insisted the photo stay until she was either walking back out of the forest or the alternative no one wanted to give voice to. I know that photo better than any photo of my family or friends. Six-year-old Jessica with blonde hair spilling over her shoulders, fingertips poking out the sleeves of a red puffer jacket one size too big, a pair of bright yellow boots pushing up over faded denim jeans, and a big toothy open mouth smile. Her family took the photo the day that they arrived at the campsite. When the sun set on the search, her father had a copy printed and plastered all over the surrounding town. They were the clothes she had been wearing when she wandered off during the hike the family took up to the waterfall. The copy hanging on our notice board is the only one left. We pulled up to the campsite in our truck. A woman with a bright red beanie pushed down over dark hair was upon us as soon as we got out. She had her phone pressed to her ear and stuffed it in her pocket absentmindedly when she saw us. Adrenaline made her voice shrill and pushed her words together. Kyle nodded and added a few calm words to get her on track. His voice and manner are perfect for these situations. He didn't interrupt, he didn't raise his voice, he only slipped in enough words to get the information we needed. Her name was Polly, she was six years old. She had been wearing a red beanie like her mother's and had faded brown jacket on. It had been passed down through the family. She had dark brown hair and brown eyes, and where was she last seen? Well, where they were hiking was up to that same waterfall and they planned to have a picnic up there. When they made it to the top, the mist had come in so thick they couldn't see anything of the view. That combined with the chill in the air convinced them to come back down. The four had walked together, mother, father, older brother Will and Polly. She had been up there with them when they made it down. On that point, both mother and father agreed, Will had shrugged his shoulders. At the campsite, the air was clear and the fall sun warmed our shoulders. Up the mountain could very well be a different story though, and it likely was, had they somehow left Polly behind the walk back. We got a vehement no. She came down off the mountain. Somehow, in the time between coming back down and setting up the picnic at the fold-out table beside the camper, Polly had wandered off. It wasn't like her, she was a good girl. As we listened, a small crowd circled us at the distance. Because it was the middle of the day, most of the campers were off walking a trail or sightseeing in one of the nearby towns. The ones that were around, elderly couples on retirement and families on holiday, picked themselves up off their deck chairs and came to see about the commotion. No one had seen little Polly, though. Kyle split us into two teams. 
The first was to search down and around the campsite, the most likely place she would be. At the back of the campsite, a tree-lined creek meandered down the mountain. Beyond the terrain was rough, grass-covered hills and gullies filled with thick bushes. If she had ventured out there, a slip could send her tumbling into a stack of reeds and no one would see her. The second team was to go back up the trail, retrace the steps the family had taken to come down. It was unlikely, but sometimes people had what Kyle called a McAllister moment. This is when a parent is sure their child is or isn't with them, and they are wrong. It is the sort of thing that leads to parents leaving their children in cars on hot days, and famously a family named the McAllisters leaving their child home alone to stave off some would-be thieves at Christmas time. Mark and I ended up on the team heading up the trail. I'll admit I was a little disappointed. Like Kyle, I was sure Polly was somewhere around the campsite. It is a selfish thought, but on a search you always wanted to be the one who finds the person. I was sure now that it wouldn't be me. We started up the trail, leaving the campsite in the search effort behind. Before we left, the mother had shown us a photo of Polly taken up at the waterfall. I kept the picture in my head as we walked. I hope we wouldn't be adding it to the notice board. The trail was eerily quiet. I had walked it many times and always come across people powering up or coming back down. Not today. The trees surrounded us on all sides, and the world went silent. We walked slowly, scanning through the forest on either side and calling out her name. We hadn't gone far when the mist came in, thicker and faster than usual. When you live up this way, you get used to it. There's a reason they're called the Smokies after all. Before long, visibility was down to only a few yards. I stopped and looked back down the trail. It was no better than the visibility ahead. It almost seemed unnatural how quickly and completely the mist had arrived. I was about to say I had never seen anything like it when Mark took the words right out of my mouth. It was comforting that it wasn't just me. No wonder the family had turned back. The ferocity of the mist gave rise to a terrible thought. Polly may be up here in the forest somewhere. It would be easy for a child to wander off or even to stop to fumble with a stray shoelace for just long enough to get separated from her family. The parents had been sure she made it down, but then there was the McAllister effect. I called ahead to Mark, who had walked on ahead. When I received no response, I skipped a few paces to catch up. As an adult and knowing the area as well as I did, there was still a moment of fear when being alone spiked in my stomach. I could only imagine what Polly was going through if she was up here all alone. Mark had stalled up on the trail ahead. He turned as he heard my footsteps and pointed out to the right. He thought he heard something. I squinted through the mist, but saw nothing. He couldn't give me any other details, only that something had caught the corner of his eye as soon as he was about to turn his head. I stepped into the trees and called after Polly. A few steps more and I stopped and listened. Nothing. Back on the trail, Mark was fixed in place. His face had gone pale. It, it moved, he said. What did? Th the mist. I turned behind and then back to Mark. I waited for a punchline or for him to break into a smile, but none came. Let's keep going. I found myself on edge. The mist enclosing us had a sudden menace to it. As we climbed it, it only grew thicker. I buttoned up my coat, and against the cold, it was like being high in the air and inside a cloud. We walked in silence. I called out after Polly half-heartedly. When I noticed Mark was no longer by my shoulder, I stopped and turned. I strode back down until I found him standing like a statue. He shook his head at me. He wanted to go down. I grabbed his arm and told him we had to keep going. It was our job and if Polly was up here, she was relying on us to find her. Mark is a big guy, but at that moment he looked small and fragile. He looked up to the sky and then back to me. He nodded and we continued. Up ahead, the trail turned to the left. As we approached, the bend shapes started to appear in the mist. At first, I took them to be the outline of branches leaning over the trail, but as we came closer, the outline stretched and deformed like clouds changing shape under a high wind. The shape coalesced into something that vaguely resembled the outline of a small child. I blinked my eyes and refocused and it was still there. The outline of a child running away from us, around the bend in the trail. I broke into a run and rounded the bend chasing after the shape in the mist. On the other side, there was nothing. Only a blank wall of mist like before. Had I just imagined it? Was my mind playing tricks? I turned to Mark to check if he had seen it, but Mark was not there. I ran back to the bend and rounded it again in the other direction. Mark? I ran a few more steps and still nothing. Mark? I called out again and again and again, but there was only silence. He was just there a second ago. He had been beside me when the bend came into view. I was sure of it. Or had he? 
We had walked in silence. Had he flaked, turned back, and left me alone? Surely not. Mark was a reliable guy. He wouldn't do that to me. Maybe I had a McAllister moment. But then, where was he? Mark? I called again and again. I ran 50 yards back down the trail and nothing. I stood with my hands on my hips, unsure of what to do next. I didn't want to walk back to the campground without Mark. I also didn't want to hike further up the trail alone. A pocket of warm air washed over me and back over my neck. It was as if someone pushed their mouth right up against my skin and exhaled. I snapped my head around and no one was there. I almost called out again for Mark and thought better of it. I took a few steps back up the trail towards the bend where I'd seen the shapes in the mist. On my left where the rustle of leaves and a sharp crack of a twig snapped. I stopped and peered through the mist in the trees. Something in there moved. I leaned forward. A few feet above the base of a tree, a small pocket of mist turned into a circle. As I neared it, it coalesced into a face. The face of a child. A small girl. Polly. I jumped forwards and the face pulled back further into the forest. I called out to the girl and followed her into the forest. If she was up here, I had to look. I had to be sure. Soon, trees surrounded me. The mist hung as heavy around the trees as it had done on the trail. I looked left and right, searching for the face I had seen or thought I had seen. No, it had to have been there. There again up ahead, the vague outline of a small girl. I put the picture of Polly back into my head so that I knew that it was her. Red beanie, faded brown jacket, dark hair and brown eyes. But as much as I tried to picture Polly, it was the other girl Jessica from the photo on the notice board that I saw. The blonde hair, the red puffer jacket and that big smile. I couldn't shake the image. I followed the face of the girl in the mist. I skipped a few steps to catch up, but she disappeared. I stood panting a little and called out. And there she was, directly ahead, standing in a small clearing. Red puffer jacket and blonde hair, six-year-old Jessica. Six-year-old Jessica, who disappeared five years ago and was now here, still six years old. I squeezed shut my eyes and shook my head. When I opened them, she was still there, smiling up at me with that big, goofy grin. I trembled. This shouldn't be. It was Polly I was searching for, dark hair, red beanie. I'm looking for Polly, I said and immediately felt foolish. The child looked up at me, confused, and the smile was gone. She turned a circle on the spot, and when her face came back into view, her face was different. Not only was her face not there anymore, it was now dark, and she manifested a red beanie. It was Polly now, where it had been Jessica a second ago. Polly? I said. She made the same goofy smile as Jessica had in her photo. I shook my head and almost yelled at her. You are not real. This can't be real. The grin faded again and her mouth twisted into a grotesque snarl. Her mouth opened wide and then wider still unnaturally so and her crooked child's teeth morphed into razor sharp fangs. The moment before I turned to run I locked with the creature's eyes, yellow and menacing. I raced through the trees desperately seeking the trail. I swung my head around and in the mist a wall of faces closed in from behind. I gave an involuntary yelp and forced myself to look away. When I finally found the trail, I turned and ran at full speed down and When I finally found the trail, I turned and ran full speed down and toward the campsite. Mark be damned, I didn't want anything to do whatever with whatever Mark be damned, I didn't want anything to do with whatever was hiding in the forest. I turned back and before I could process anything, I hit a wall in the trail and tumbled to the ground. It was Mark. I scrambled to my feet and Mark stared at me with eyes filled with terror. Did you see it? I didn't answer him. I grabbed him by the arm and started down the trail. We had to get down. Mark made a noise, a half laugh, half cry, and I turned and followed his outstretched hand. There, standing near the trees, was Polly. But it wasn't Polly. She stood there and watched us with an arm held out, beckoning us into the forest. Don't look at it. I fixed my eyes on the trail ahead, trying to give myself tunnel vision. In my imagination, the faces sprung up again on each side. I covered my head and yelled at them to stop, and then as if someone flicked a switch, I felt the warmth of the sun on my face. I looked up and saw the blue of the sky. We were out of it. We slowed to a walk. When we came back to the playground, Kyle asked us if we were okay. He could see that we were shaken up. I didn't know how to explain what we had seen, so I told him that we did not find Polly. The team at the base had not found her either. I am convinced of two things. Polly went missing on that trail somewhere in the mist, and whatever we saw was not her. There is a second photo hanging on our notice board. Polly has joined Jessica, two girls taken by something lurking in the mist.
North Dakota Horror by Andy J. This happened to some of my friends and me during the summer of 2021 after my high school graduation. I'm from a small town in North Dakota, and my buddies and I are the stereotypical rednecks of the city. You know, the type who drive loud trucks and is always armed somehow. We were doing what most teenagers do for fun in the Midwest, driving around and shooting signs. When we got low on ammunition, one of my friends, we'll call him Gary, recommends we check out this snowmobiling warming hut where he's experienced some paranormal activity. Now my buddies and I are all Christians and are very religious, but we couldn't pass up an opportunity like this either because we were also buzzed or because we were just dumb teenagers with nothing to do. So we arrive at the old shack and sit in my other buddies, who will call him Larry, F-150 truck. We turn off the headlights and the dash lights and look and listen. Even though I didn't believe in the paranormal at the time and was skeptical, I felt reassured that I had my AK with me. It's important to note that it is hot for a North Dakota evening and extremely dark out. We were all content, feeling good, and someone in the back seat suddenly said it felt like we were being watched. After he said that, I flipped the safety off my AK and tried to be aware as possible. Then he shouted, Holy crap! In the most terrified, helpless voice I'd ever heard come out of him, he tells us to look in Larry's rearview mirror. What I saw was genuinely horrifying. In this rearview mirror, this glowing white figure stands about 7 or 8 feet tall. It's only about 30 yards away from us, peeking behind a tree. Larry immediately turns his truck on and throws it in reverse to get a better look, but just as abruptly as it had appeared, it was instantly gone. I fired a few rounds in its general direction, and immediately after I did, the air got freezing cold. After that, Larry floored it, tearing out of there like the Dukes of Hazard. We were all spooked to our bones, but one of my buddies, we'll call him Barry, says he saw nothing. Now, the white figure was terrifying, but the creepiest part is why Barry didn't see it when all the rest of us did. A Night in Horror by Electrical Line 6982. My name is Heinrich, and I live in Sweden. I will tell you a story that happened to me years ago, but I will never forget it. The worst night and time of my life. I apologize already now that my English is not the best, but I hope you still understand anyway. In 2004, I worked as a forklift driver at a large furniture company in the small town of Husqvarna in Sweden. I loaded and unloaded trucks and collected goods that were going with them. I moved there after school with some friends, who also worked at the same company. I met a girl, and everything went well, and I lived life. But in 2007, it came to a break with my girlfriend, and my friends from school had started to move away so I felt that I didn't have much left in Husqvarna. I started thinking about moving away, maybe going back home to my childhood town of Karlstad, which is 300 kilometers north, where my parents and childhood friends still lived. Karlstad is close to the border with Norway, and one of my friends, Tobias, has started to work as a forklift driver for a Norwegian company in Oslo. A Swede earns almost three times more to work in Norway than in Sweden, so many Swedes try to get a job there. So when my friend Tobias from Norway said I could come to Oslo and look for a job at the company he worked for, I didn't hesitate. To get to Oslo from Husqvarna, you must drive about an hour west towards Gothenburg, Sweden's second largest city, and from there, move the other four hours on a highway called E6 with two lanes in both directions with some wire railing between the north going side and the south going side. The south going side moves through primarily dense forest. In fall and winter time, the E6 is heavily trafficked by trucks and other heavy vehicles. As a rule, trucks drive in the right lane, while other faster traffic goes in the left. But during August, many truck drivers are on vacation. So, at the evenings and nights, E6 is pretty much empty. So on August 24th, 2007, I started traveling by car towards Oslo from Husqvarna, a distance of almost five hours. The idea was to stay for some hours or so, and then go home again. So I left early in the morning and arrived at lunchtime in Oslo. I met my friend Tobias and got to go with him to his job and meet his boss. 
We talked and joked around and I immediately formed an excellent bond with the boss. And soon, I submitted my application to start working there. Afterward, my friend Tobias and I hung out at his apartment, we talked, ate, and had a good hangout. I forgot to pay attention to the time, and then I noticed it was already 11pm. Realizing I must go home now, I said goodbye to my friend, jumped into my car, and began my 5 hour journey home. I moved away from Oslo and went into the dark, dense forest for an hour. It was a full moon, so you could still see pretty well, even without street lights. After driving for an hour and now finding myself with a dense forest on both sides of me, I see in the rear view mirror how a car, a Volvo 240, pulls up behind me very close. I don't drive too fast or too slow, and since it's a two lane road, I think that if they're in a hurry they can just overtake me in the other lane. After a while, they did overtake me and pass me, but then they turn right into the right corner of the road and stop in front of me. I must quickly turn into the left lane to avoid crashing into the Volvo. I look into the rearview mirror as I continue driving, and soon they get up behind me again and are very close. And soon they overtake me again, and this time they drive away a bit and then turn into the right lane. Again they stop, and then the back door of the Volvo opens, and a massive man in his 30s jumps out and walks toward my car. I'm starting to feel uncomfortable about this, so I'm definitely not going to stop. I turn around again, go into the left lane and pass the man in the car. As I drive by, I see the man trying to grab the door on the passenger side of my car. Now I absolutely panic and increase my speed to get away from them, but they catch up to me and do an overtake again. They stop a little way ahead, and soon the same man jumps out again and tries to make another attempt at my door. The drive continues and the same thing repeats itself over and over again. Soon I catch up with another car and I get behind this car, hoping that the people in the Volvo will get scared and give up because we are now not alone on the road anymore. But when I lay down behind this car, they and the Volvo overtake me and the other vehicle and lay down in front of us. The vehicle between us must feel threatened because after some short time, the car between us drives out on the left lane, overtakes the Volvo chasing me and accelerates and soon disappears. I pick up my mobile and dial the emergency number for Sweden which is 112, but the automatic voice operator says the number is not in use. Since I am in Norway, the Swedish emergency number does not work and I did not know the Norwegian emergency number right then and there. I call my dad and hope he's awake. My dad answers while the hunt continues in the same way as before. I explain with panic what is happening and want him to help me find the emergency number to Norway. My father is a very calm individual and rarely gets upset. He probably didn't understand the seriousness of the situation either, so he said, take it easy, try to drive away from them and stop and then ask what they want. After a few attempts to get my dad to cooperate without success, he's clearly not getting it. So I hung up and threw the phone in frustration in the passenger seat so that it bounced down between the floor and the heart and disappeared under the passenger seat. Soon, I am approaching Halden, a small Norwegian town. I see a sign showing an exit lane to the right. I think that now I am saved. I can turn off the E6 and the car chasing me can hopefully leave me alone. But to turn into the exit lane, I have to slow down. When I slow down, the car chasing me comes and drives around up on the exit lane in front of me and parks across it at the end, so that I can't go off the exit lane and exit the E6 because they're now blocking me entirely. So, with nowhere to turn, I have to continue on the E6, and the panic is now massive. I'm terrified, and now I decide that they won't be allowed to overtake me again before I border to Sweden. So, I accelerate up to 160 kilometers an hour, and they don't manage to overtake me. They only tend to drive up so that they are almost level with me. I look towards them and see how four people in the car are sitting, shouting something at me, and lunging to try to run into my car with their vehicle. We will soon be coming up to a large suspension bridge between Norway and Sweden. I panic and think that if they run over me or if I lose control of the car at this speed, I will fall through the railing and down about 50 meters if not more. But we get off the bridge and shortly afterward there is a small truck stop where trucks stop and rest and show customs officers what they have in their cargo. I quickly turn off and those in the Volvo continue and I see how they disappear on the E6. 
I stop in a parking lot inside the truck stop and just breathe. Now, finally it's over, I thought, but it turned out this was far from over. I bent down toward the passenger seat and tried to find the mobile phone that was under there, but I can't find it, so I leave and walk towards the customs house, which is closed. But there is a payphone outside, and I pick up the phone and dial the emergency number 112 and arrive and get connected to the police. I explained what has happened and where I am now. They tell me to get back in the car and a police car will come within 10 minutes. I thank them and get back in the car. And I'm afraid those people in the Volvo will show up again after 40 minutes without the police. So I go out to the phone and again call. They retake my report and even though I say that I called and reported about 40 minutes ago, they tell me to again wait in my car and the police will eventually be there. Although that I say that I am happy to stay on the phone with them until the police arrive, but they promise me they'll be there in a few minutes. So, I hang up again. I go and sit down in the car and wait. Another 30 minutes pass without any police showing up. I sit and think about driving on. Partly I'm afraid that they'll come back here, and then I just want to go home. So after a few minutes and another attempt to find my cell phone under the seat with no success, I decide to drive on. It has been at least 90 minutes since I stopped here now, and the people in the Volvo have not come back here. So I think they are now moved on, and it must be far enough away for me to be able to start making my way home. I leave the truck stop and drive out onto the E6 again. I drive for just a few minutes and come to a left turn. When I make the turn and come around to the crest of a new straight, I see to my horror. This Volvo is parked in a small parking lot next to the road. I break to a stop and immediately feel the panic. I'm standing about 50 meters away. I'm considering turning around and driving against traffic to avoid passing them. But I don't have time to think more because the back door opens, two people get out and start walking toward my car. Another person gets out of the passenger side. The Volvo then opens the trunk and starts picking something out that I can't quite see what it is. When the other two men start walking toward me, they turn to the left side of my car and start walking toward my door. Then, I don't even know, I don't even think, I just press my gas all the way to the bottom and drive away. I look in the rearview mirror and see silhouettes of the people running toward the Volvo again, and I now see from the lights of the Volvo, and I now see the lights from the Volvo start up and shine toward me. I now understand that they are now taking up the chase again. I keep driving and realize I have a bit of a lead now. I was looking in the rearview mirror and saw them in the distance. A badger runs out in front of my car when I look ahead again. I don't even have time to steer away. I just run it over with the left front of my back wheels. Right after I drive over, I hear something from the car scraping against the asphalt. Something has come loose after the collision. In panic and terror, I must get off the E6 now. Terrified that the car will break down and give up, soon there is a minor exit on the left which I quickly turn onto and get away from the E6. When I arrive a little way up, I see a sign from a small village that is about two kilometers away. I can't remember the name of the town now. So I start driving on this smaller road towards the village, and I still hear how it scrapes under the car. Then I see a small forest and to the right, at the turn in the street, I no longer see the Volvo in the rearview mirror. And in a panic to get far away from the E6 and big roads, I turn into this forest road and continue into the trees. The road is very narrow. There are two ruts, the grass is in the middle, and around the car are large trees. I drive further into the forest road until I come to an end of the road, and it's just more forest. I manage to turn the car around, and now I'm facing the direction I came from. I turn off the engine and exhale. Everything around me is quiet and dark, but soon I can see between the trees far away two headlights approaching. The panic returns. They have seen where I turned off somehow and now they are coming yet again. I see it's them, and when they break through the trees, I realize now that it's just survival that counts. I take my wallet and car keys. The mobile is where it is. I get out of the car, close and lock it. I put my wallet in my pocket, turn around, and start running into the forest as fast as possible. I hear people in the Volvo calling for me. I run more profoundly and deeper into the woods. After some time, I reach a small clearing and see a large stone under a very big tree. I climb onto that rock, grab the tree branches, and climb up. There are thick leaves on the components, and soon I have risen to the middle of the tree and I am entirely hidden. I sit down on a thick branch against the tree trunk, 
breathe and listen. I am convinced that I will not survive this night. They will find me, and now I can do no more to get away. And no one knows where I am. I think of my friends and my parents. Will they ever find me out here? Will they ever know what happened to me? Or will I just become a missing person case? When I sit and I think about it, I hear how they are walking in the forest, looking for me in the distance, shouting, We'll find you! But luckily, they never came near my tree. I hear how they get deeper and deeper into the forest, but soon they turn and go back. I see everything through the leaves, their flashlights as they search through the woods. I soon hear how they continue back towards the cars. Then it's quiet. I dare not leave the tree. I stay there until it's morning and the sun has risen. Then, I climb down very slowly and very thoroughly and walk quietly back towards the car. At this point, I'm absolutely terrified that they will be standing there waiting. I'm pretty sure they wrecked my car, but when I go to the road again, I see my car. The Volvo is nowhere to be found. It seems they haven't even touched my car. After this, I just... I just went home. I tried to forget all about it. Until this day, I don't know what their case was all about, and what they wanted, or what would have happened if I had let them talk to me. Honestly, I'm terrified to find out. Fishing with my dad by Think Physics. When I was young, my dad always took me fishing at dawn. It didn't matter if I was five and whiny, he could give me a donut and a fishing line to watch and peace would settle. It honestly surprises me I still remember this, but this was a scary experience for a five-year-old, maybe even a six-year-old. Our day started pretty early. Outside it was still dark and my dad packed up all our fishing gear. We went out to the pier. It was right outside a hotel and it was me, my dad, and it was just his favorite spot because nobody shooed the fishermen away. We usually saw one or two people early as we were there, but this time there were quite a few, I think four or five, what I imagine were college kids outside drinking, probably taking in the sunrise. What happened later that morning was not my dad's best decision, but he said he needed to grab a hook quickly from a car. He said he'd be back in an instant. The gutting knife was right there, and if I ran into trouble, you know, I could use it. A plus parenting, I know. The youngins were pretty loud, and I was vigilant because I was a nervous kid. So I just kept watch. An ambulance siren blared at a distance, and one of the guys looked behind him and said, Your dad just got run over by a truck. The girl chastised. Stop, oh my god, you're so bad. While the other guy laughed like it had been the funniest thing anyone had ever told. Again, I was a very nervous kid and like five or six years old. I didn't know any better, so I, so I believed him. I didn't know whether to run and find my dad. There was only one exit and it was right by them. Or grab the knife in case they wanted to do something to me. It felt like an hour had passed while I was thinking about my dad's state. But it had probably only been a couple of minutes. The tension melted away when I saw my dad walking back towards me. I almost cried into a puddle when my dad asked me what was wrong as he gutted the fish he had caught earlier. I told him about the man and that he told me he got run over. He clenched the knife he was holding, still covered in blood, and approached the guy and his cohorts. What the hell did you say to my daughter? L listen sir, I don't know what she heard. We just asked her if she had caught any fish. I'm gonna ask you one more time. Why did you tell her I got run over? He inched closer and closer to them. The dude was frantic and probably sobered up real quick. In a chorus of, we don't want any trouble, the others scrambled for their cooler and practically ran away. I should have been more worried that I didn't know if my dad was going to stab a couple of kids, but that aside, I felt like the luckiest, safest kid in the world. The Dangers of Remote Fishing by Anonymous I had always been fascinated by the great outdoors and the beauty of nature, so when I heard about Yosemite National Park growing up, I knew I had to go. I packed my gear, and I set out on a hiking and fishing trip, excited to explore the park's crystal clear streams, towering trees, and breathtaking scenery. I had been hiking for quite a few hours, taking in sights and sounds of the forest when I realized that I had lost my way at some point. The trail that had been guiding me seemed to just disappear, and I couldn't find any markers to guide myself back. 
I tried retracing my steps, but the forest was just too dense, and I couldn't tell which way was which. Panic began to set in, and I began to realize that I was lost. As I walked, I noticed that the trees seemed to be getting closer together, and the forest was becoming darker altogether. The sound of the babbling brook that had been guiding me was fading away slowly, and I was left with an eerie silence that only amplified my fear. After some time, I stumbled upon a clearing, and in the middle of it was an old cabin. It looked abandoned, and I hesitated before going in. The door creaked as I pushed it open, and the smell of mildew hit me. The inside was dusty, and the furniture was covered with cobwebs. It was clear that no one had been here in quite some time. I decided to make camp inside the cabin for the night, hoping to find my way out of the forest in the morning. I was lucky to find a place that was dry. I got a fire going in the fireplace and began to make myself comfortable for the night. And as the warmth of the flames washed over me, I felt a sense of relief. But as the night went on, my sense of safety would begin to fade. The silence was unnerving and I kept hearing strange noises coming from outside the cabin. It sounded like something was walking around the perimeter and I could hear the occasional snap of a twig or rustling of leaves. I tried to convince myself that it was just some sort of animal, but the fear was too immense. As the night wore on, the noises became more frequent and more prevalent. I realized that I wasn't alone here. I could hear something moving around outside the cabin and it was not my mind playing tricks on me. I felt the sense of dread wash over me. It sounded like something was trying to break in, scratching and clawing at the walls ever so slightly. I tried to ignore it the best I could, but the fear was far too great. I lay in my sleeping bag, heart racing, my eyes darting around the room looking for anything. Every time I thought the noises had stopped and would begin to close my eyes, they would immediately start back up again, even louder and more intense than before. It was like it was playing mind games with me It knew when I was about to fall asleep. Finally, the noises stopped altogether, and I was left with an even more creepy, eerie silence. I tried to convince myself that everything was okay, but the feeling of unease just lingered. It never really relented. I decided that I couldn't stay in the cabin any longer, and then I had to find my way out of this forest ASAP. As I stepped outside, I saw a figure in the distance standing amongst the trees. It was dark and tall, and it seemed to be staring at me. I immediately stopped, stared right back at it, and the figure vanished into the forest. I ran in the opposite direction, trying to find my way out of the park, but the forest seemed to be alive all around me and it was as if it was trying to keep me trapped inside its depths. I had heard more strange noises, and I had saw more shadowy figures in the distance. It was like I was living in a nightmare. The night was long, and my body was tired, but I knew I had to keep moving. I stumbled upon a river and followed it. This was my last hope. I was really hoping it would lead me out of the forest, but the river was treacherous, and the rocks were slippery. I fell several times, bruising my knees and scraping my hands. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, a lifetime if you will, I saw a faint light in the distance. My heart leapt with hope and I began to run towards it with all I had. As I got closer I realized that it was a campsite. There were a few tents set up and I could see the glow of a campfire. I stumbled into the camp gasping for breath and the campers looked up in surprise. They were a group of three friends who had been hiking in the park for a few days now. They gave me a fair chance and listened to my story and their faces were full of concern. They offered me a hot meal and a place to sleep for the night and as I sat by the fire I felt the tension in my body begin to ease just ever so slightly. I was grateful for their kindness and for the safety of their company. The next morning I set out with their group determined to find my way out of the forest. They were experienced hikers and knew the park well and they helped me navigate the trails. We hiked for a couple of hours and I could feel the relief wash over me as we got closer to the park entrance. As we emerged from the forest, I looked back at the towering trees, dense undergrowth, and everything that I had gone through, and the fear I had felt the night before seemed distant and unreal, like a dream that had faded with the morning light. I thanked the group for their help profusely and set out on a long journey back home. As I drove away from the park, I couldn't help but think that the strange occurrence of that night before, maybe it was just my imagination. Or was there something more sinister lurking in the forest? The memory of that night stayed with me for a long time, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Whenever I thought about it, I would get nightmares. But despite the fear and uncertainty, I knew that I would return to Yosemite National Park one day. The beauty and majesty of the park were too great to resist. 
The lure of the wilderness was way too strong, and plus I had to go pick up my camping gear eventually. A Trip to Paradise by I Am Kyle I had always dreamed of going on a fishing trip to the Florida Keys, so I jumped at the chance and my buddies invited me to join them on a weekend trip. We arrived at our rented house on the water's edge on a Friday's evening, and ready to spend the next two days catching some big fish, we were all very amped. The house was a charming old beachfront cottage with peeling blue paint and a wraparound porch that faced the water. It had three small bedrooms, a cozy living room, and a fully equipped kitchen. We were absolutely thrilled to find that we had a dock in the backyard with a small motorboat tied to it, which was perfect for our fishing trip. The first day went by smoothly. We woke up early and headed out to the ocean with our gear, and within just a few hours we caught some decent sized fish. We decided to head back to the house to cook our catch and rest up for another day on the water. That night, things began to feel odd. Sitting around the campfire, we heard strange noises from the nearby woods. Something was moving around there, but we couldn't see anything with the darkness. We shrugged it off as just some local wildlife or fauna and went to bed. We woke up early the following day and returned to the water. This time, however, things felt different. It was hard to put my finger on it. The water was choppier, the sky was overcast, and the eerie silence hung over everything. It was like the world was holding its breath. As we started to fish, I noticed the water was murky and dark, almost like it was hiding something that it didn't want to show. But we kept at it, hoping to catch something big. That's when everything started to go terribly wrong. My friend Jack suddenly yanked on his fishing line and we all rushed over to see what he had caught. But when we looked closer, we noticed it wasn't a fish at all. It, it was a human hand. Now, of course, we were all horrified. We had no idea what the heck to do. We quickly pulled into the line, hoping that it was just a fluke, but as we continued to fish, we kept pulling up more and more human remains. Bones, limbs, even a skull. We knew we had to get out of there and bring this to the police ASAP, but as we tried to start the engine to get away, of course, in a cliche manner, it wouldn't freaking start. We were trapped on the boat with this gruesome discovery and there was no way out. That's when we saw a figure moving through the water towards us. It was a man, but he was covered in seaweed and algae, and his eyes were cold and dead. He started to climb up onto the boat and we all stumbled back in terror. We fought back as best as we could, honestly we did. We used any fishing rods, anything we could to poke and prod this man to get him off, but he was relentless. His movements were jerky and unnatural. He started to lunge at us, trying to bite us with his sharp, broken teeth, and then we realized this was no man at all. He was some sort of creature from the deep. We tried to reason with it, to plead with it to let us go, but it was too late. The creature was upon us, trying to tear at our flesh with whatever claws and teeth it had. It was like a nightmare come to life. A creature straight out of a movie, like the creature from the Black Lagoon. I don't know how we all survived that day. I don't know how we made it back to shore. But luckily, one of us finally got the boat moving. We were able to use the momentum of the boat jerking and everything we had to push to knock it out into the water. We started hauling ass and did everything we could to save our lives. We did some digging after we got to shore and tied up the boat. We locked all the doors, of course, all the windows, made sure nothing could get in after we, you know, experienced whatever the heck we experienced, and we did see that there had been a series of disappearances in the area and that a creature had been encountered by many, many people. But the memory never fades from me. I'll never forget that thing. A lot of people think that this monster is some sort of local urban legend, but I know it's real. I don't know if people will believe me, and I don't really care. I know what I experienced. State Park Fishing Nightmare by Tony M. It was a pretty hot summer day, and I decided to take a break from the city and spend some time fishing at the local state park. I packed my gear and drove to the park, eager to relax and enjoy the peaceful surroundings. As I arrived, I noticed there was a small group of people standing near the water. They looked like they were in their mid-twenties, and they all wore black robes with hoods that covered their faces. 
I thought it was kind of weird, but, you know, people LARP and do all kinds of stuff like that around here, so I tried not to pay too much notice. They didn't seem to notice me as I walked by, but I couldn't shake that feeling that something was off about them. I found a quiet spot by the water and cast my line. The fishing was good and I caught several fish within the first hour. Every time I looked up, I noticed that that group of people in the black robes had moved closer. They seemed to be watching me and it made me uncomfortable. As the day went on, the group of people grew larger and more of them arrived in the park. They all wore black robes and hoods, and they all seemed to be focused on me. I felt like I was being stalked, like I was some sort of local celebrity. As the sun began to set, the group of people moved closer once more. They formed a circle around me and I felt trapped. They were so close that I could see their faces now, and they looked strange and almost otherworldly. Their eyes were dark and hollow. They had strange markings on their skin. One of the people stepped forward and spoke to me in a low, hissing voice. We've been waiting for you, they said. You're in the sacrifice. I, I tried to run, but they were too quick. They tripped me up and grabbed me and dragged me into the woods, their voices echoing in my head. I was terrified and confused. What the hell was happening to me? As we entered the woods, I saw that they had built some sort of makeshift altar out of stones and twigs. They pushed me onto it, and I felt a sharp pain in my chest as they began to chant. I almost couldn't move. I almost began to feel paralyzed. I don't know if it was with fear or something else. Suddenly, the chanting abruptly stopped, and the group of people looked up. I heard a deep growling coming from the woods, and then I saw a pair of glowing eyes in the darkness. The group of people panicked and ran, leaving me alone on the altar. I looked up, and I saw a massive creature standing over me. It had razor-sharp claws and teeth, and it was covered in what I can only describe as disturbing-looking fur. I realized that the group of people had summoned it, and they had intended to sacrifice me to it. The creature looked down at me, and I felt its hot breath on my face. I closed my eyes and waited for the end, but instead I heard a deep, rumbling growl. When I opened my eyes again, the creature was gone, and I was alone in the woods. I stumbled back to my car, shaken up and absolutely terrified. As I drove away from the state park, I realized the group of people had been worshipping something beyond human understanding, and that creature was likely whatever god they had been praying to. I don't know why it didn't kill me. I have no idea why their sacrifice didn't go as intended. My only guess is, is that it went after them or something else. If anybody has any idea what I, what I survived, what I got out of, please let me know. I'll Never Go Fishing Again by Anonymous For the longest time now, my one true passion in life has been fishing. I have a high pressure job as a stock trader in my hometown of Philadelphia, and nothing seems to help me unwind from a stressful week quite like a day's worth of fishing. I think it is the combination of the serene setting, the slow steady pace of it, and the fact that I am reconnecting with nature. When most of my life is spent in a stuffy office space staring at a computer screen. But there has always been one dream fishing trip that I've always wanted to go on, but never really had the time to arrange. And that is bow fishing down in Louisiana. Ever since I saw a segment on it on the World Fishing Network, I was just dying to try it. I always wanted to try out archery too. So combining that with my passion for fishing just seemed like the obvious choice. I had mentioned it to my wife once or twice, and being the great listener that she is, she ended up arranging a trip down into the bayou for myself and a few of my buddies for my 37th birthday. We flew down to New Orleans on a Friday morning, which I had no idea was named after Louis Armstrong. Then, spent the day hanging around Bourbon Street drinking cocktails and soaking up the jazz. Then, after fighting off the hangovers the next day, we drove down along the Mississippi River to this little place called Burris, where we found ourselves at New Orleans Bow Fishing Charters. The guys down there were awesome, sharing all of their little tricks and techniques with us to ensure we would have as much of a lucrative trip as possible. Then, once the sun had set, we loaded up into the boat and set off into the swamps. It really was like a dream come true for me. The landscape down there really is something to behold. But here's the thing. 
The shallow bottom boat we were on had these floodlights on it, just below the waterline. Most fishermen will tell you that this is basically cheating since the fish tend to be attracted to light. But since we were just using bows and arrows, I guess it kind of evened out the odds. However, having lights on your boat like that totally ruins your night vision. So, as much as you can see the water around you perfectly, it blinds you to the darkened areas beyond. And that makes you feel vulnerable indeed. There could have been anything out there in the darkness just watching us and we would have absolutely no idea it was ever there. So we are having a ball for the first hour or so, mostly just making fun of each other for missing our shots so much. But eventually, we started getting the hang of this whole accuracy thing. We are pulling in all kinds of black drums, redfish, and flounder, which are delicious by the way. But I could not see any of the fish I wanted to shoot, and that was alligator gar. I had my heart set on getting my hand on a big 10 footer to show the guys back at the office, but I was worried the entire trip might pass before I get the chance to shoot one. But eventually, one of my buddies is looking over the side of the boat into the brightly lit but murky waters, when he calls out to me that he sees a big old gar hiding among some reeds just a few feet away. He knew I was after one, as was everyone, so everyone got out of the birthday boy's way so I could get a clear shot on it. So there I was, right on the edge of the boat with my bow and arrow in hand, trying to get myself a good aim on this gar. Jesus Christ, was this thing huge. I mean, it was easily a 10-footer, the same exact kind of monster that I had been dreaming of getting my hands on, and I really had to regulate my breathing to keep my hands from shaking too much. Only just as I start to get a steady aim on the thing, and I'm about to fire the arrow into the water, it starts to slowly creep further away from the boat, almost like this damn thing knew I had my eyes on it, but I was not going to let it get away. And as dumb as this was, I start leaning over the edge of the boat as to not lose it. That is when I lose my balance and I start wobbling and tipping over the side of the boat before my buddies could reach out to grab me and reel me in. Bow in hand, I crash into the murky waters head first, getting absolutely soaked in the process. I can hear the guys in the boat laughing their asses off before I even resurface, and when I finally do, I got to admit, I was laughing too. But as I look up from the water, they do not look so cheerful anymore. They are all just looking behind at me, staring at something with these looks of terror on their faces. I'm all like, what's the problem? Before I look behind me, I see a pair of glassy eyes glowing in the lights of the boat just before they disappear under the water. It was a gator, and it was huge. I start scrambling to get back to the boat, trying and failing to scale the side of it before the thing got me. All my buddies rush to my side and try to grab me, but the bow fishing instructor rushes to the opposite side, grabbing one of my two friends and imploring them to do the same. Lest we tip the whole thing over and all end up in the water, just as they get a grip on me and start dragging me upwards, I feel an intense pressure on my right boot. It was horrible. I just start screaming, it's got me, it's got me over and over, feeling my leg beginning to stretch from the guys dragging me up and the gator trying to drag me down. Then suddenly I am free, and the guys can pull me back into the boat, but that did not bring any relief, as in that moment I can think of, is this how this gator has bitten my damn foot off? There was no pain, but I have heard in those adrenaline-fueled moments you do not feel the mass of injury that has been inflicted on you. I am scrambling around in the boat, trying to get a look at my leg, half expecting to see a missing foot and blood pouring out from the bottom of the boat, but to my infinite, but to my infinite relief, all I see is a soaking wet sock, covering my still attached foot. The relief, the pure relief I felt in that moment I can hardly put into words, and it did not take me all that long to figure out that a hangover had basically saved my life. Since I was feeling so rough that morning, I had not bothered to tie my boots up all that tight, giving them enough slack to allow the gator to pull it straight off of my foot. It was without the single most terrifying moment of my entire life. Seeing that thing's eyes practically glowing in the floodlights of the boat put the absolute fear of God into me, and I know how lucky I am that I was able to walk away from the situation with all of my limbs still attached and relatively unharmed. I could just as easily bled to death lying on the floor of that boat thousands of miles away from my kids, my wife, and my family, while my buddies looked on helplessly. 
We took a fair amount out of the swamps that night, and I suppose it was only right that the swamps took something back. I did not manage to catch the gar I had been lusting for in the end, but that was okay by me. I am just happy that I did not get eaten by an alligator. <laughs>